So you're here to see President Trump. Have you met President Trump before? Yes, I've met him. I met him in Hamburg at the G20 meeting. We had a good call. We talked about the region, talked about our bi bilateral relations, and I look forward to seeing him again. Okay, and so you'll sign the agreement, uh, or the agreement will be signed about the airplanes there? Uh, yes, uh, SIA is signing it with Boeing. It's a private agreement, but it's emblematic of the relationship and of what we hope America will get in Asia and why America has a great interest in what's happening in Asia. So TPP, as you mentioned, was not uh, agreed to by the United States, but the countries that signed onto it in Asia, they are going to move forward without the United States in effect? Well, we are talking to one another about how we can move forward without the United States. Uh, 12 minus 1 should be 11, but when you make 12 minus the biggest one, it's, you're not quite sure what the remainder is. Uh, and it's complicated because it was a deal which was on the basis that America would get something considerable out of it, the other countries would get something considerable out of the US. And overall, when the US joined, it fundamentally shaped the structure of the package. And now we've taken up the US, and the rest of us, having made all these arrangements to satisfy Mike Froman, now that Mike Froman is not there, why are we still doing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we are trying to work out a package which makes sense. Yeah. I, I hope something can be worked out. We've been talking about it. I see that the new New Zealand Prime Minister has some thoughts on this. We'll have to see uh, where she lands. Okay, so the main message that you want to convey to the President today is what? That Asia is important to the United States. Asia depends on the United States. There's a lot we can do together and a lot that you can contribute. And your policies need to be based in political support in America, but I hope it will be possible to develop that support in order to pursue policies which will benefit America for many decades, as you have done in bipartisan way for many years. Now, historically, Singapore has had a very close relationship with the United States and still does, but also has a close relationship with China. So which country is more important to Singapore, United States or China? I think they are both very important. Uh, the President Xi Jinping last year talked about overlapping circles of friendship, and we hope to be in that overlap. Okay. Now, you were in China recently. You met with the four most senior Chinese leaders. Uh, what impression do you have of what Xi Jinping wants to do in his next five years? They were busy preparing for the 19th Party Congress. I was there just a, few, just a month before that. Uh, the Congress is in progress now. Uh, Xi Jinping has made his, uh, policy, his the main speech at the beginning. He's laid out a comprehensive agenda which goes well beyond the next five years and stretches to 2050 of all the things that you'd like to do for China. And these are none of them earth-shaking new goals because they've been talking about them for some time, whether it's economic growth, whether it's uh, improving the living for the middle income, whether it's talking about social support, whether it's environmental, whether it's anti-corruption, or most important, and item number one, whether it's continuing uh, vitality of rule of the Communist okay. Party of China. So when you were growing up, your father, as I mentioned earlier, was the first Prime Minister of Singapore. Did he say, I want you to go into government, or did he say you could do whatever you want, or did you no, I, he, he, he didn't plan for me to go into government. Uh, when I was about completing high school, I wanted to get a, pre, uh, a government scholarship because all the good students wanted government scholarships. And if you didn't, you thought something was wrong with you. And I got a government scholarship. And then a year later, uh, we were building up the armed forces at that point, and the armed forces needed talent. And it intro they introduced an armed forces scholarship which was something new, and I decided to apply for that. My father encouraged me. So I went to Cambridge on an Armed Forces Scholarship. And after that, I came back and served in the Armed Forces. Uh, some years later, I spent a year which not many of you, and a place not many of you will have been to, which is in Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. And <laughs> There's some people in Washington who probably have spent time there. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I have kindred souls, or so some right, of them right, went to right. Quantico. Right. <laughs> Okay. So, so, and, then, so th and that was where I was headed, and beyond the armed forces, well, we didn't think quite that far, but probably somewhere in the civil service or in the public sector. But in, 20, in 1984, uh, or around then, my predecessor, Mr. Goh Chok Tong, who was then my minister in the defense ministry, 
asked me, he says, would you be prepared to come into politics? And my wife had just died, and it took me a while to think over, but I said, yes, I will do that. So I resigned from the army, uh, went, stood for election, was elected, I went into government, and I've been there for now more than half my life. Okay, and did your father tell you this was a difficult line of work, or he didn't discourage you, your father? No, he didn't discourage me, but he did say it's going to be difficult because I'm his son, and people will make comparisons. So uh, now you have uh, announced, I think, publicly that after the next election, you probably will not stay for a full term. Is that correct? No, I, I do not want to stay the whole term. I've said that I, uh, soon after the next election, I strongly hope that there will be a successor ready and in position to take over from me, and I really shouldn't be Prime Minister beyond 70 if I can help it at all. So when you do step down as Prime Minister, what might you consider doing? I will think about it then. Okay. No. <laughs> no. I hope I will still have some, uh, something valuable to contribute. No private equity positions for uh. you? <laughs> no. So today, uh, can you explain to people who haven't been to Singapore uh, how Singapore is managed with a relatively small population, 5.6 million people, to become one of the economic powerhouses of the world, really. You've got, a, I think, the third highest GDP per capita in the world. Uh, how did Singapore do this from a running start in 1965 when Malaysia really didn't really think it, Singapore could actually grow very much? Well, first of all, our backs were to the wall. Either we did this or we died. And there were a lot of people who thought we wouldn't do this, and there were some people who hoped we couldn't do this. So we decided we'd show them. So we got together, we worked hard, we pursued policies which at that time were unconventional, and in particular, uh, we decided to allow ourselves to be exploited by multinationals. Because in the 1960s, the conventional wisdom was that multinationals were evil, they exploited the populations, and they were to be kept out and uh, kept down, and you should promote your own indigenous uh, economic development. And we decided that by exploiting us, they created jobs for us, and they generated markets for us, and they brought in technology and organization. I think so be it. And we were very happy to do that, and it, it led us to take off. So that was one very important factor. A second important factor is that we built up our armed forces through national service, a draft, and every male citizen, age 18, will do national service for two years, at that time two or three years, and we built up a credible armed force, and Singapore was seen as being defensible and not just a walkover as had happened during the, when the Japanese invaded. And in the process of building up an armed force through national service, we also built a nation because the people having served together with comrades of all different walks of life came out and it changes your attitude towards the country. But today, who do you see as your military rival that might actually invade? Well, one of the reasons we have so many friends is because we have a good armed force. Okay. And uh, now let's talk about inside the country. Uh, you have a reputation for producing students that score extraordinarily high on math tests. Is there something that Singapore is doing in its schools that have such high math scores from your students? Uh, we are not sure. I think our students work very hard, uh, and uh, the parents put a lot of uh, emphasis on education. That's one part of it. Uh, another part of it is that our math curriculum, somehow we seem to have um, found the right formula for how to, the right combination between drilling and thinking. Because you do need to learn certain things, and at the same time, you need, do need to know how to jump out of the box and solve problems, and we seem to have got the formula right. And other countries, including some American jurisdictions, uh, have tried out our textbooks and seem to be happy with them. Now, you were a math student yourself, is that right? Yes. And are you an expert still in math, or do you, can you keep up with what the students are doing today? And no, I'm a voyeur. I just w read what mathematicians do and wish I understood what was up. Now, a number of years ago, um, to some controversy at the time, Singapore uh, invited uh, gaming companies or gambling companies yes. to enter Singapore, and some people were, were concerned about that. Yes. How has that experiment worked? I think it has worked out well. Uh, it is contentious. It still is not unan unanimously welcome, but it is something which we thought would be a plus for us because we convinced ourselves that if we want to develop the tourism market, this was one way to do it. 
and it could be done in a way which would limit the social impact and which would generate uh, dividends beyond the gambling profits. Because it's really a, a, a comprehensive resort. You've got conventions, you've got hotels, you've got uh, retail, you've got restaurants, you've got shows, you've got a lot of other activities and spin-offs which make sense. And so we decided that we could take the chance. Our people were already exposed to gambling. There's all sorts of gambling legally happening in Singapore. There's gambling online, which is impossible to shut out. There's gambling illegally, which happens all around us. And well, we are not that virginal to be impossible to be exposed to temptation. So we, we decided to allow this. We made a market solution. We said, if you are Singaporean and you go into the casino, it's $100 for 24 hours of exposure. It's a fee so paid to the government. So in other words, if you're a Singaporean, you pay extra. If you're from China, you don't pay extra. That's right. And hopefully you'll gamble more from China and you will okay. end okay. up paying something to us. All right. Now, Sam and, and that has worked out very well. The result is that it's mainly a foreign market. The impact on Singaporeans has been limited. And the, uh, the impact on jobs in terms of GDP, in terms of revenues, has been considerable. Okay. So I say it's a plus. Have you ever been in gambling yourself? Or? I, I, I went in once to take a look. Okay. I paid $100 and was very regretful that I didn't do anything with it. Okay. Now, Singapore, uh, years ago, um, received some international attention. I think your father was against chewing gum. Yes, he was. And Implacably. So he didn't want anybody chewing gum in, this, in Singapore, and you could be fined for that. Is that still the policy? Or? No, you can't be fined for chewing gum. What we did was to ban the import of chewing gum. And fortunately, we are not a native producer. Oh, so how do you get it then? Well, some people smuggle it in. Oh, okay. Um, I thought the concern was, he was concerned, was that people were taking it on buses and putting it under the bus chairs. Well, the, I think the final, I'm not sure if it's the final straw or the final wad, was when somebody took a lump of chewing gum and stuck it on a train door and the train <coughs> stalled. Oh. So he decided that was a good reason to okay. pursue the matter, which he had wanted to do for a very long time. Okay. Now, talk about Southeast Asian countries uh, today. Um, and let's talk about yours first. Uh, why is Singapore a good place in which companies should invest, uh, American companies or other companies? What's it, why is it a good place to invest? Well, if I may be permitted uh, commercial, it's where you're able to have political stability, a good st environment to live, a good business environment to work, a workforce which works very hard and is disciplined and will be cooperative with management. And basically, you are in the middle of a region which is prospering. And from Singapore, you can cover a big part of the region. Uh, China, to some extent, India, Southeast Asia, Australasia. And therefore, you come to Singapore not just because of Singapore, but for the region. Suppose somebody has never been to Singapore, and they're not interested in being a business person. They just want a nice tourist place. Uh, why should they visit Singapore? What's the appeal of Singapore as a place to visit? Well, you don't have to go to the casinos. You can just see the city because the city itself, I think, is a very gracious place to live and something which we are very proud of. If you've been to Marina Bay, you have seen what the skyline is like and walk around and you get a sense of what the people are like, the atmosphere, the, the, the absence of uh, anxiety or uh, uh, insecurity. You don't see soldiers on every corner or policemen. But you see people who are working, who are getting business done, uh, who are bringing up families, who are looking forward to the future. And do you have a lot of Americans living in Singapore now? Oh, huge numbers. I think you have one of the biggest American schools in the world in Singapore, which is a very good one. They send a lot of students to Ivy League. So that may be another reason to come. Okay. Um, okay. So one of the, uh, your neighbors, <coughs> let's talk about your neighbors. How is Indonesia as a place to invest? And is that a power, growing economic power in the region? Uh, it's a big economy. They have 250 million people. Um, they have a lot of natural resources. Uh, the, they ha the government is working hard trying to bring in infrastructure investments, uh, trying to bring in natural resource investments, uh, trying to create jobs because the population is still growing quite rapidly. Uh, their costs are low. Uh, the environment is um, progressively improving, 
but it's a big country and uh, th that those things take time. But we have very big investments in Indonesia. We are one of their biggest foreign investors. And when you say investors, this is through the GIC or through... Uh... No, uh, uh, well, GIC will have some proportion of their portfolio in Indonesia. As they, are, they are globally diversified. The Masih has some in uh, Indonesia too, but a lot of private sector investments are in Indonesia. Now, for those who aren't familiar with GIC, it's more or less your sovereign wealth fund. The GIC so, is a sovereign wealth fund. And it's generally considered to be about the best managed in the world. It's been around for quite some time now. Um, what is the, the reason for su its success, would you say? I'm not sure we would uh, put ourselves as best managed. We benchmark ourselves with other countries. I think there are two or three factors which make it work. One, we made it a company rather than part of the government or a quasi-government organization because that means you can set it up on its own terms, you can pay people properly, you can generate the right um, incentives and bonus structures and, uh, and corporate culture in order to manage this fund not like a private fund but as a custodian, as a, as a steward on behalf of future generations of Singaporeans. So that's one part of it. A second part of it is that we treat this religiously as a fund management outfit. We do not use them as an agent of national service or of a government state policy. So if the government wants to take money to subsidize an industry or wants to use some money in order to um, uh, pay for some um, benefit for the population, well, we vote money on the budget. And then we take the money back, it's ours, we decide what to do with it. But when GIC invests, their remit is long-term risk-adjusted returns. And strictly that. So they don't worry about a, polit a political overlay. Our job is to protect them from the politics so that they can do a professional fund manager's job. And that's very, very hard to do inside a government. Okay. So, uh Talk about your other neighbors, Malaysia. Um, as, you know, given your success, does Malaysia ever say maybe you would like to reunite with them, or they want you back now, or not? Uh, we we don't often discuss such possibilities. <laughs> I think there was a fork in the road 52 years ago, and we t went one way, and they went the other, and you cannot turn back. They've gone further in their route, and we have gone further on ours. And if we came back together, I think we would cause enormous difficulty to each other. Okay. Now, let's talk about Japan. Uh, Mr. Abe was, uh, in effect, re-elected, uh, yes. strongly, strongly re-elected. So how big a presence is Japan now in Asia relative to China? Uh, in economic terms, they have big investments. They have substantial MNCs in Singapore. Their banks are in Singapore. At one time, their banks were among the biggest in the world. Now less so, but still significant. Um, the Chinese are beginning to invest outbound, and they're also present in Singapore, not yet to the same degree. In terms of regional presence, I think the Japanese do a, a significant amount in terms of ODA, foreign aid, uh, diplomacy with uh, Asian countries. Um, but somehow, I think in the Japanese system, it is harder to pull all of the whole of government together and operate as Japan Inc., which the Chinese have less difficulty doing. Now, uh, because of World War II, is there still some animus towards Japan in Singapore and Southeast Asia? Uh, well, the generation who experienced it will never forget. They are passing on, but the subject is not disappeared. Uh, earlier this year, we had a small kerfuffle in Singapore because we put out, uh, we made an exhibition in our, uh, in a historic site, the Ford Motor Factory where the Japanese, where the British surrendered to the Japanese. And we called it the Sionan Gallery. Uh, we call the exhibition the Sionan Gallery and Sionan is what the Japanese called Singapore when they governed it, when they occupied it. There was a humongous row and I think that was the wrong, we did the wrong thing and we changed the name of the gallery. It was. It was not just those who lived through the years who said you are, you are putting the name of the oppressor on our exhibit, but even many others who said, why are we doing this? Okay. So what about India? Is India becoming a bigger presence in Southeast Asia? 
Well, India is growing. Their interest in, South, in the, the outside world is also growing. Uh, in relative terms, their GDP is, I think, about a third China's. Their foreign trade is just one-fifth China's. Um, their interest has been very heavily focused on the subcontinent because they have a very complicated environment in the subcontinent with all of their, with the other con with their, with their neighboring countries. But as their economy grows, and if Mr. Modi's policies work as, as it, it develops more interdependence, it will have a growing interest in the region and a growing uh, activity in uh, uh, diplomacy, in, in economic relations, in infrastructure. And uh, we hope that it will play a constructive role in the region. Now, you're going to be in the United States for a few days, and you're going to be in Washington for a few days seeing other members of the administration. Uh, can you tell us who else you're going to see and who you're going to see in Congress? Well, uh, Mr. Tillerson is away, um, and so is Mr. Mathis. And I'm going to be meeting the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross. I'm going to be meeting Mr. Mnuchin. Uh, I'm going to be meeting Gary Cohen and, uh, and Mr. McMaster, okay. as well as some congressmen. They're very important, and senators. Okay. So uh, what your main message you'll convey to them is the importance of Asia for the United States as well? Yes, and I, I know you're preoccupied with domestic matters, and every country has its domestic issues to handle, but the external world is moving, Asia is dynamic, and America has its... You not only have a role to play, it's really your game to lose. Don't lose it. Now, um, you flew over here on Singapore Airlines, yes. right? So, no, uh, actually not. Oh, you didn't? I, I, will, I flew over on somebody else's airline. Somebody else, okay. <laughs> because Singapore wasn't available, I guess, at the time. Well, we don't fly directly to Washington, alas. Okay, well, maybe you can change that. Well, we hope so. The intermediate stops don't quite agree. So, <laughs> Singapore uh, Airlines has a very good reputation for service and so forth. What is Singapore Airlines' secret? Why is it generally rated the, about the best airline in the world? Well, the chairman is here. You can ask him. I think it's because he knows that our reputation is online and furthermore that they have to uh, earn their bottom line. And if they don't, well, uh, there's no bailout for them. So okay. they work very hard. And they've built up a very strong team. And there's a very strong pride in it amongst the team in SIA and amongst Singaporeans in our national airline. Now, do the European uh, leaders ever call you up and say you should buy Airbus for your airlines? Or? Uh, regularly. Okay, okay. And what do you tell them? You tell them... I said, I will consider it. You make me a good offer. Okay. Which sometimes they do. Okay. And so today, uh, do you enjoy being Prime Minister as much as when you first became Prime Minister in 2004? Well, you get into your stride, you know what you can do, what you can't, how long things take to do, what are sensitive matters, and you, you try to push the, to the limits of what is possible. And the, the greatest pleasure of being Prime Minister of Singapore is, other than this interview, um, <laughs> is what? What's the greatest pleasure? Uh, to feel that you have made some contribution to a country which has been stable, which has been united, and which has been making progress steadily now for more than a decade. And the greatest challenge of being Prime Minister? The job gets harder, in a way, because your expectations are higher, you're at a higher level, and it's a much more, it's a more uncertain global environment. Every private equity fund is telling us that it's very hard to make money nowadays. But they still and, tell you to give them money, right? <laughs> well, if they show good performance, we'll think about it. Okay. And uh, do you, would you like your children to go into government or politics? It's up to them. I, they have not shown any interest. I think they have to have the right combination of temperament, character, ability. So we will see. But I, I, so far, they have been happily pursuing their own paths. And do you think uh, when you're in Washington, you have time for anything other than meeting government officials? Any sightseeing? Any uh, restaurants you want to go to? Or? Well, yesterday, I went to have a walk at the Rock Creek Park, a beautiful fall day. Two weeks later would be even more beautiful, but it was very pleasant, and the leaves were turning, beginning to see some color. And then we had lunch at Shake Shack. Oh, okay. <laughs> How was that? My children told me I had to do it. Okay, okay. Well, on that note, I want to thank you very much for um, coming to Washington, and thank you very much for this conversation. Thank, thank you. you.